Um, yeah, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Because, like, in, in the beginning, I thought, like, there will be, like, I'm all alone, you know? So, yeah, you will not regret that. That's a good talk, I think. So, a little bit about myself. So, I'm a specialist engineer in CBE, and um, I'm mainly doing research in areas like computer vision, machine learning, and other things. Um, so what we do in found, we've got a, like a foundation team that looks after frameworks, and as a small part of it, like a team of two or three people who is taking a current like mobile technologies or future mobile technologies and trying them uh, to see if they are applicable to digital banking. So what we're going to talk today about is um, deep learning, and um, and deep learning. Um, so we're going to see how changes in three main areas. Um, actually affect deep learning. So main areas are hardware, software, and people. People and the data behind. So intersection of those areas basically gives us um, a successful applications for our apps. Um, but I will start, like yesterday I learned that everyone loves um, quizzes, so I'll start with a small quiz on a top supercomputer, right? So here's three questions and while so three statements and one of them is false. So please raise your hand. Uh, it's actually good for you when you raise your hand. Um, it's actually like physical exercises, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> so raise your hand if you think it's the first one, uh, which is false. First statement is false. Okay, raise your hand is the second one is false. Okay, and uh, raise your hand if you think that the third one is false. Right, okay. Um, so, yeah, the majority, I guess, is right. So this is number three. Um, so, in fact, this is a supercomputer called, it's um, unpronounceable, so it's some Chinese name, okay. Um, but essentially, it's, uh, it's known to be fourth, the most energy efficient supercomputer. And in, in fact, it can do 100, about 100 uh, picaflops in, um, in, in peak performance. And the cost of building, you know, it's, it's quite a bit, you know. So we probably, none of us will sort of, you know, ever worked on, on this kind of computers. Um, and amount of storage, I just love that, you know. So this is, all of the Netflix can be there. It's amazing. Um, but, so we will start with the hardware. And like Jake is told today, um, everyone knows the law, um, Moore law, right? So Moore law was uh, sort of going on for quite a while. Um, but in fact, um, more laws sort of not not true anymore for for Intel processors. So in the recent years, we can see that um, so the last four or five dots here is is actually uh, about GPUs. So more law is still true for like GPUs. GPU power is is increasing, and um, and still we sort of on this accelerating kind of curve, right? Um, what's interesting is that it, the Historians found that this phenomenon, they call, they call it accelerating change. So they say that every evolutionary system uh, tend to accelerate the change, right? So it's not just about technology, it's not just about computers that increases in terms of computational power, but also, uh, let's say, if we take a look on, um, if we take a look on supercomputers, <coughs> so they increase power, if we take a look on GPUs, they are kind of on an exponential curve. But also, let's say, if we take a look on, um, if we take all of the scientific workers that ever existed, all the scientists, right, Einstein and others, you know, put them all together, then we find that, like, about, they say, about 90 to 80 percent are still alive. So what they say, basically, is that uh, the amount of uh, scientist workers we had in the past is significantly smaller than we have now. And if we take a look on, say, how many scientific publications we have or scientific journals exist, then we see that this is an exponential curve, right? And um, as you may know, we all studied a little bit of math. Exponential curve has some singularity point. And um, so supercomputers now are still sort of on the track, you know, of, of this exponential curve. And they say that, well, by 2025, what we're going to see is we're going to have a computer that possibly can simulate brain, okay? And 2025 is not that far. So it's only like seven years, right? Let's, uh, let's be patient. Um, so <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about CPUs versus GPUs, right? 
So this is a conventional computer, like computer we can have at home right now. It may cost like two two thousand dollars, but um, essentially for deep learning applications, CPU um, kind of sucks. So a CPU is much slower, like on on our normal computers, than than GPU sort of. Um, so just keep it in mind, right, that we're going to see what, how it affects like uh, mobile, our mobile phones. So let's talk a little bit about like processors, like Jake touched on it, but basically the idea is that processors are getting smaller and smaller. If you take a look on Intel's uh, roadmap, then uh, by 2022 they, they think um, they're going to have five nanometers processors. I run this presentation um, on a laptop that has 22, right? And the current laptop, uh, like mo most of us have, that doesn't have a you know logger that with the light, it has 14. And so <clears throat> we're getting smaller and smaller computers, which is pretty cool. And I brought you today one of the examples of weed uh, products that um, we see. Let's say um, someone said it's cool to use this animation, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is Intel Curie. It's actually a, an Arduino as that kind of small, okay? So that Arduino has a hardware nodes for neural network. These hardware nodes can be used to, to see what kind of shaking pattern this uh, board is experiencing to, say, trigger some functions, right? So what I'm trying to say is neural networks is not just software. It, they come to the processors, although this product this particular product is discontinued for some reason, but it's still quite fascinating to see um, a deep learning on a, on a you know, Arduino maker's product. Another interesting product I've seen uh, recently is, is this little thing, right? So it's only size of, I guess, this big, okay? Um, what's fascinating about it is that computational power it has is bigger than my laptop, okay? and it only consumes seven watts. So, well, applications for this kind of thing can be, you know, ro robotics or, um, you know, flying drones that you can control with the onboard um, sort of computer and visual algorithms or deep learning. This is quite fascinating. <coughs> um, let's get back to our basis. Let's talk about mobile GPUs, right? So if we take a look over the years, uh, this is GPU power in gigaflops, um, theoretical one, so that's not a benchmarking. But um, iPhone 7, you can see, is like double of what iPhone 5S had. And um, it only happened in like three years, you know? So computational power of mobile GPU is growing. And, um, well, well, I guess it's growing pretty fast. Um, at the same time, if we compare it, oops, sorry. If we take a look on Android phones, well, it's pretty similar, you know? So all of these um, mobile GPUs are pretty similar. Um, but if we compare it, say, with MacBook Pro, we can see, whoa, that's, there's a gap here, right? Um, and if we take, take a look, if we put here Titan X, if you know what Titan X is, right? So we're like, whoa, whew, what is this? So I can't even see the performance of iPhone 7. Um, what I'm trying to, to show you guys here is, is actually a gap. So what, if you've seen, like, say, Oculus uh, 3D comments on, uh, on uh, Apple computers, they say, well, they're not good enough, you know? They're not good enough to run VR or 3D. That's not true, like, at least not, not true anymore. So what Apple will do, sort of, is they incre decrease the gap between uh, mobile um, phones and laptops. And I think they're gonna, that I'm just speculating, I'm gonna, they're gonna introduce some technologies to d decrease this gap. Um, that's because R&D budget of Apple, you know, is by the way similar to a revenue of CBA, right? A little bit, just, <laughs> just saying. <clears throat> it looks like an exponential curve to me. Um, and so they spend, I guess they will spend more and more money on hardware, because hardware is their business, right? They're selling devices. And so that what we see this year is the, um, there's a press release of ImageTech. ImageTech is a provider, current provider of GPUs, mobile GPUs for Apple. Um, so all the iPhone 7 you run, they, they've got their um, GPU. So they said, well, Apple is working on their own GPU and they're breaking a contract with, um, with ImageTech. 
So in two years' time, roughly, we're going we're gonna to see Apple releasing new mobile GPU, which might have, you know, I don't know, some better and better computational power. And um, also what we saw, like that was in April this year, we were sitting and looking at the press release of NVIDIA saying that, oh, yeah, we released the uh, Mac drivers uh, for Pascal um, uh, video cards. And we were like, but there is no laptops or iMacs who run NVIDIA, you know, not modern ones. Why would you do that? And so, of course, that was because Apple was preparing, you know, this external GPU story in order to reduce the gap between, you know, the desktop processors and, and, uh, and laptops. So now laptops are pretty powerful. You can just plug it in for the Thunderbolt 3 and um, you can enjoy your VR experience. This is quite fascinating. <clears throat> now let's talk a little bit um, about software. And I want to start with asking you a question. What do you think? Um, do you, do you think that in your brain there's one, brain, one small neuron that recognizes a grandmother? Do you think you have one little neuron in your brain that recognizes grandmother? Um, hold on on answering this. Just uh, give it a think, okay? And um, let's learn a little bit about neural networks. <clears throat> so in fact, neural networks have a, a history of, um, it will be 75 years of history in, uh, in next year. And so they, they were formalized during the war, and then there was perception, perceptron and perceptron machine invented. If you've never seen this before, so this size is, is um, comparable with the human size, right? So this, this like maybe, you know, a little bit taller than a human. And so the guy would come, or girl, and uh, plug, you know, the wires here and here to sort of connect neurons. And then he, he would use like a screwdriver to adjust the weights of this neuron <clears throat> in order to teach, teach it to do something. So it was extremely slow, extremely manual, and an absolutely terrible process of, of teaching this perceptron network to do something. Um, and after that, there was some guy, Minsky, proved that, well, perceptron by itself cannot do XOR function. Can you believe it, right? A neuron cannot do XOR function. That was terrible. Everyone was, um, you know, everyone abandoned the idea of neural networks and simulations. And um, that, that phenomenon afterwards was called AI winter. So no one would uh, do anything with that technology. And so in, um, three years later, some guy um, actually proved that uh, layers of network of perceptron can actually simulate SOAR function and can do it pretty well. Um, but sort of that was unnoticed. And, um, that propagation algorithm later on, and then they start thinking about parallel computing, maybe several cores and stuff. And um, that was a tipping point, 1992, when um, they did this neuro rewiring experiment, which I will take you through today. Um, very important experiment um, that was, was done in MIT. And um, the first neural net, uh, convolutional neural network appeared in 1998, and then well, 2015 was the year when convolutional neural networks performed tasks on uh, image recognition better than humans. And um, I'm super excited that this year, convolutional neural networks came to iPhone 7 in a very convenient way. I will talk about it, this later. So um, as I'm speaking to you guys now, what happens is your ear is transferring the signal or vibration of the sound into this center of your brain. And this center then, it's called auditory cortex, then decodes this information and um, that's how you understand what I'm speaking about. <clears throat> so what they did in uh, MIT is they decided to sort of check the hypothetical idea that our brain actually has only one learning algorithm inside. So no matter what you do, you're trying to see, you're trying to touch, or you're trying to hear, this is all the same one learning algorithm in our brain, and that's how it works. Um, so what they did is they took ferrets, they would cut this wire that goes from your ear, from not your, but ferret's ear, to the center of the brain, and then they would plug there, or like rewire, um, the, the, the neurons that go from the eyes of ferrets. 
And with time, maybe like several days a month, those ferrets who were like conducted surgery on, they would um, start to see again. And they would conduct the discriminatory, like image discriminatory tasks on them. And those tasks would show us that sort of um, ferrets can see on the same level as they would, would, would be able to see before. So what it means uh, is that basically no matter sort of what center is involved, the vision would, would um, you know, the learning algorithm in, in hearing center is the same as the learning algorithm in the vision center. So <clears throat> that's how they sort of try to prove that, um, that we've got only one learning algorithm in our brain. And um, later on, they, they started thinking how, like, how to do this uh, with images. And so what they end up doing is, this is fully connected layers, but um, this is just a demonstration, you know. So it, roughly, convolutional neural network, what it does is it just takes the patches and um, with the really small features on them. And then by conducting different, like, com, com, sort of, by, um, by multiplying the, the, the s several, like, patches types, we can get uh, more sophisticated features. And so more sophisticated features form, like, even more sophisticated, and then in the end we can see like, um, you know, now, now a neural network have a brain that sort of recognize particular faces. So the answer, current science thing, the answer on my question about grandmother is that yes, you've got one neuron, neuron in your brain that recognizes your grandmother <clears throat> at the end. Um, and there are even um, some products, commercial products for, for people who can't see um, that sort of uh, allow them to see through, through the tongue. So imagine um, this is a camera. So it takes the picture, pixelates it, and then makes a pattern of what it sees. And then it reproduces this pattern on a metal um, plate that is put on your tongue. And, um, and it pulses according to how much light <coughs> in that area, you know. And so that's how, like, blind people can actually see with their tongue. But like, let's get let's get back to the mobile stuff, right? I promised you some. Can you? Oh, damn. Anyway, so that's good. Um, in 2015, I remember I did a talk about um, neural networks. I was so excited; it was really great. But <clears throat> at the end, I was talking a lot about how matrix multiplied. You know how you need to get the reverse matrix, and you know it was really really low level talk on how to do neural networks in Objective C. And that was done using this um, VDSP, if you know, this is a, an API, it's called Accelerate Framework. So VDSP is just part of this framework and uh, you can, you know, very efficiently multiply matrices and do some lots of map, math. But uh, with time, you, you can see that iOS introduces more and more convenient ways of doing math, which was great, up until iOS 10, when they actually introduced some routines inside the API that um, simplify, simplify our work with the neural networks. And so there are specific routines that you can use for basic um, neural networks. So there are layers, you know, so it's much more easier. It became much more easier to manipulate. But it was still very low level. So you would need to sort of combine layers together, you know, and, um, you know, do stuff very manually. Up until this year, they introduced CORML. What's also fascinating about this is that uh, up until last year, all of this routine would work on CPU. But this year and last year, they introduced those routines and they work on GPU. <clears throat> um, if you can, I don't know, I, I was trying to find how, like, what's the computational performance of A10 fusion processor and I couldn't find. Like, Maybe if, um, if some of you know, like let me know, but uh, I couldn't find. Um, but um, I tend to believe that GPU is, again, like become this year or next year will become faster than a CPU on our mobile phones, which means, you know, doing deep learning, we should use GPUs. Um, but that also brings us to a new paradigm, how we work with machine learning. So this is old model. Uh, I call it old, but like, you know, most of the, <laughs> most of the talks 
on most of the you know services, say Microsoft, Google, and others. That's uh, their mo main model. So let's imagine if we've got some data set, and we train a model, and then we put it to some backend. And so let's let's be more concrete. We've got an app that recognizes flowers, right? So what you do, you collect lots of flowers um, images, label them, and that's your data set. Then you train a convolutional neural network, and then you will have a trained model, so that means you've got a structure and weights, and you put it to the backend. And so what app does then, it takes the image, user takes the image of the flower, it sends it to backend, backend checks what's the flower, and it returns back the result. The new model is a little different, and that was introduced by Coromel, I think, mainly. So you've got your data, you train your model, but then you move the model and you download it from the phone. And then what happens is the model is pre-trained and it happens and it's stored on your phone. And then all the computations say you've got an image, you don't send it anywhere. You don't you're not relying on the internet. You, the user data doesn't leave the phone, which is very important for, say, banking, because privacy issues. And so the machine learning, like actual sort of computation, happens here. But the training still happens somewhere. And um, I think this is the model for the Apple, because they sell devices. They want us to sort of do more and more sophisticated software for, those, for these devices. And they will work on good hardware they can, that can handle it. But um, this model is more for Google, you know, Amazon, and maybe Microsoft, because they work on services. And um, remember <coughs> WWDC? There was this talk where how, like, my main question was, how do we get this model? You know, how do we do this? And so they said, well, you can choose the one of these frameworks, you know, Coromel tool, um, Python, and you can just convert it, it's very easy. So which one to use? If you never used anything before and you want to try, I would highly recommend you Keras, because like they've got a huge, um, um, how to say, model zoo, how they call it, because um, it's, very, it's very easy to use, and also it's super high level, and they use this as a backend TensorFlow at Tiana. So if you've heard about Google TensorFlow, so that's what Keras is actually using underneath. But at the same time, interesting thing happened is that Apple acquired Turi. So we might see more, I think, tools or maybe extensions for Xcode for deep learning. All right, I see you a little bit bored. How about example, right? So um, I saw that this has just appeared, and um, I think in September there will be a real uh, scientific paper uh, published on this. So there's a neural network that takes a screenshot and converts it to Xcode storyboard. <laughs> what, it, um, what it means, so it, it also can do websites. So it can take a screenshot and create a website, you know, for those who, who love web. What it means is that, well, I'm excited. We don't, we're not going to do any, like, you know, routine job anymore. So this is great. Um, and let's talk about, about people. That's, that's my last part. So ImageNet, <clears throat> this is the lady sort of who was staying behind the image, ImageNet data. So if you heard about this, um, or maybe not, so this is a big challenge that happens every year. And um, so this lady started thinking, oh, maybe we need some data. Where, would, where do we get it? And so she started like labeling data, you know, taking a picture and saying what is in, on it. But, but she wanted to have like a, about a million, so, We've got 1,000 categories of different images, let's say cars, chairs, other things. And we've got 1,000 of pictures per category. So we've got about, we need about a million of um, pictures that are labeled. And so they started like involving, ah, come on, we can do it with, with students. But you know, students are reasonably lazy. That's, that's, you know, that's their nature. And they say, well, thank you very much. I'd rather study something. And um, that didn't quite work until they found this um, Amazon uh, Mechanical Turk service. And they basically cross, um, uh, how to say, so they basically outsourced this to some developing countries. And many, many people around the world would label this data. And that's how they got the first data set ready by nine, 2009. And after that, um, 2012 was the big 
challenge and that's, that's when they become sort of known. Before she was associate professor in some unknown university, now she's like working in Stanford, very well respected and talks on every, on every conference. And what's interesting, right, is the outcomes of this um, challenge. So here you see the different results of the, of the, of the teams who worked on, on this challenge. And so basically in 2015, the first several teams just reached human level of accuracy for these tasks, for image recognition tasks. And then this year you can see that 29 of 38 teams got better than that, you know. This is pretty cool, right? So that means now <clears throat> machine can do better image um, recognition classification than humans. This is cool. Um, so what it means for Coromel, right? Um, we have lots and lots of models. If you go on Google, right, you can find lots of different models in Keras, in Cafe, and, and others. But which ones we should try, right? First of all, we want to try those who are accurate enough. Because we don't want to sort of annoy people with some, you know, you showing in the human and it says it's a chair. And um, second, we want, um, we want a network that can run on our iPhone. And remember, the theoretical computational power of our iPhone 7 is about 256 gigaflops. And um, if we divide it for real-time performance, maybe by you know, 10 or 20, depending on FPS, then we get this kind of estimate that 10 or 15 is kind of, it's kind of right. And that's why we see that Apple gave us Inception V3 as an example model. And um, if you try some other, like VGG19 or something, it will be terribly slow. Like, don't even, don't even try. <clears throat> so that's, that gives us a sense how we should choose the models to run on, uh, on our iPhone. Um, just a little story on AlphaGo. Have you heard about um, uh, Deep Blue, the computer that was playing chess against Kasparov? Yeah? Um, there, was a, there was a big, um, you know, media coverage and stuff, but then uh, when Kasparov asked to rematch, and they said, no, 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 we don't want to rematch. And they, they also refused uh, to give him logs. This story is completely opposite. So AlphaGo is a Google DeepMind. It's a computer can play Go. And, you know, it was playing like against really, you know, not experienced players. And then in 2016, played against really high level player and win. And then um, in uh, this year, it, it would play against number one player and uh, again win. And so, <clears throat> They also optimized the algorithm, so initially it would run on massive like cluster of computers, while the last one was running on just one single machine. And um, Chinese Association of Go even gave them a you know, uh, nine done professional player rank for this algorithm. You know, like this is quite fascinating. Um, if you want to see how TPU like V2 looks, this is this one block here. It's just like how much does it take to run this algorithm? And what, what they also did is that they give to community games that AlphaGo did against itself. They, they gave them like 50 games to study, and uh, some of these games uh, considered really good. Like, <clears throat> um, so these were, were uh, an examples of like how machines can do tasks, but they, they all are very like you know special tasks that machine can do. It's not like general intelligence. It's still very sp special intelligence. So what are the drivers of uh, deep learning? Well, competition, open competitions, and open source. Like uh, today, there was a really great talk on open source. But if you take a look on so on uh, contestants or participants of the challenge, you see that most of them, 90% of them are open source and willing to disclose the method of how they're doing it. And um, it's funny, but 3D games as well. Like the, the, the sort of, the more demand for 3D games, the more GPU will be more powerful. And that drives it, uh, drives it through. And so even Apple now followed this open source model. And if you've never seen it, there's now a blog from Apple, who is a really secret company, never did it before. They now share with us their machine learning uh, insights, which is pretty cool. So yeah, and the, the main trends are like teamwork. So it's always like a, 
we're building on each other knowledge. And um, they found a bigger, bigger models giving better accuracy, but that doesn't help us mobile developers because we can't run these big, bigger models. End-to-end -end deep learning is one of the main trends, I would say. If you want to have a see like how YOLO works, I have an uh, iPhone. I don't, I don't want to demonstrate it like wide, but I have an iPhone. Come and see me. I'll show you how it works. And um, basically, CNN and RNN work, uh, networks are production. So they say, well, there's no doubt. They work. They work really well, sometimes better than humans. But the reinforcement learning is something that's to come. And they still think about applications. Um, and of course, all of this generates questions about the culture. Like I've got my friend, um, when he see me, you know, I, I did the compiler for BrainFuck. It, it's, a, it's a language, OK? So it's a compiler. And then I, I try to sort of make a program for this language using um, genetic algorithms. And he said, well, what are you doing? Oh, stop it, stop it. This is, you're building a Skynet, you know? <laughs> well, it, essentially, I guess the less you know about one particular technology, the more you're scared, the more certain uncertainty it generates, and the more you're scared about it, you know? So these are main questions like, say, <clears throat> Um, in Silicon Valley, they, they're talking about chatbots a lot. And they say, well, if someone's chatting to chatbot, and chatbot says to you, uh, so you say to chatbot, well, I want to kill myself. And chatbot says, yeah, go on. And then you kill yourself, right? What happens? Who is responsible? Like, these kind of questions are really, like, um, in the air. Um, but if, if we take a look on sort of our our improvements over the time with these models, we see that, yes, we over overdone the human level, but really it's not that much. Like, we can't really ever do it, like, on, um, like, a thousand times. So it's, it's normally, like, about 5%, 3% at the moment. And so you know these guys, right? And have you seen the conversation between them recently? So what I think they're doing is, like, um, they're engineering the association. So they want us to have with this little neuron that once it's, it's here, it's like AI, it would, associate it, with, uh, it would be associated with uh, Elon Musk or Mark. And so Mark was really like, you know, we are genu summoning demons and stuff. Um, but let's see what the actual scientific uh, guy thinks about. This is Andrew Ng. He used to be um, Baidu um, sort of head of science. So you used to have a team of uh, 1,300 people, you know, working on AI projects every day. And he says, well, worrying about this um, as a rise of, you know, evil, ki evil robots is like worrying about overpopulation on Mars before stepping on it, because we're really not there. <clears throat> and um, have you seen, so OpenAI is a, is a project that is supported by Elon Musk. Have you seen their recent uh, updates on... Um, how they made a, a bot for Dota 2. So this is an event that uh, was held two weeks ago. It's much more bigger than WWDC. You know, WWDC is <laughs> 5,000 people. Here there was like 20,000 people get together, you know, just to watch how the, the best teams in Dota 2 playing against each other. And so they run the bot, uh, one with one, and the bot was like, you know, winning in a row every like single player. So. So that was pretty fascinating. I was like, yes. And in my mind, you know, open AI means it's like open source. I can, and I can go and see what, how it's done, you know? Like, so I was super excited. I went to their website, and it says, well, we are not ready to talk about this agent internals. No. So, um, and it looks like open AI is specifically doing the same thing as Deep, DeepMind, and it's like, you know, private uh, enterprise. Um, so there's no really big difference between them, you know? <clears throat> what we can be scared about, I would say, five minutes, yeah, thanks, is um, about quantum supremacy. Um, raise your hand have you, if you heard about quantum supremacy, like the, the pro as a problem. Okay, so essentially they say that quantum computing is so much more powerful is that if we reach the level of a uh, quantum computer that has 50 qubits, then any algorithm that we use, not, not any, but like most of the algorithms that we use now for security reasons, like TLS 1.3, all RSA-based uh, RSA algorithms will be crackable. Like, you know, um, 
And so this year Google announced that they will reach 50 qubits, you know, but um, <clears throat> but the problem with their computer is is, um, is that coherence, like, if you, okay. So the main thing about a quantum computer is a coherence time. So the small, basically coherence time means how long you can run your computation, right? So on our normal computer, I can run it forever and, until the power ends, right? On a quantum computer, it's not the case because of the noise and other things. So coherence time is a very important parameter. So what Google promised, they, they're going to have 50 qubits, but they will be sort of D-wave qubits, which will last only like milliseconds or maybe a second, which means you can run this computation. Yeah, that's good, but only for a second. And then you need to dump the, the computation current state to the storage, reset your qubits, and then dump it back to the qubits. You know? So <clears throat> that's not quite a, a supremacy yet. We shouldn't be scared about it. Well, we are developers. We shouldn't be scared at all. Like, you know. Um, but but um, recently they announced, basically this week or last week, that um, CBA, UNIS, W, Telstra, and uh, Government of Australia are making um, a proper silicon, uh, you know, quantum computing computer. And um, they promise it's, it's going to be a matter of like 10 years when they reach 10 qubits. And um, these qubits, well, like I was told, <coughs> uh, are going to have a coherence time about 30 seconds. It's still like not, you know, not an entirety, not enough time. But 30 is, is like a universe more time than you know milliseconds. And so, what we also should be sort of aware of is the social biases. So this is a a, a quote from one of the researchers. He says, "Well, if we're training data, if the training data reflects social basis, then the algorithm will help them." So, for example, there are algorithms um, that work, say, in prison to detect if, if human will tend to come back to prison after, after releasing, right? And so what, um, they run this algorithm for, like, years. And what they found is that, in fact, essentially, the algorithm was working like, if it's um, if it Afro-American guy, yeah, it tends to, tend to come back to the, you know, to the prison. If not, if it's white guy, oh, it's all right, like, you know. And um, so this kind of uh, social basis we should be aware of and, and look, like look after them. So future, I think, is exciting, right? To me, I'm not scared because, like, the closer you are to this technology, the, the sort of the more you understand how it works and the, the less uncertainty you have in the brain. And I think, like, um, like someone said, we should embrace the change at the career panel. Uh, someone said we should embrace the change. And, uh, you know, Python is not that bad. Yeah, <laughs> probably we should try. So I bought uh, I bought a G, uh, external GPU and I'll try to you know run some uh, algorithms. But let's probably it's a good cross killing for us. And um, ask yourself how big is your R&D budget? Is it going up or going down or is it like you know fluctuating? Um, and so in summary, I think headway is getting smaller and getting better, and we'll see the new releases from Apple. In a couple of years, software, you know, open source and, and goes beyond the accuracy for some tasks. This is good, but there's, that's nothing to, to be scared about. And people, well, should be excited and, you know, participate in this process. Thank you very much. And um, all my research notes I put in this uh, repo. If you want to have a look, like there's the learning resources, there's uh, links to the articles. Um, yeah, please. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.